I'm here with Alexander McCurse, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Alexander, let's talk about Hong Kong and the protests that are not stopping. They're picking up speed. The Chinese government also seems to be ramping up its uh, its response to the protests, which are, are getting violent. Alexander, take us uh, into this story a little bit, which is gaining momentum. And uh, it is not uh, calming down. It's actually going in the reverse direction. So, Alexander, give us uh, your take on it. Maybe take us back to why we're here yeah. and uh, yeah. what's happening with uh, with the Chinese response to these protests. Let, let, let's first start with understanding the situation, the constitutional situation in Hong Kong, because I think unless we understand that, it's very difficult to make much sense of what's going on. Now, Hong Kong was a British colony. It was ruled by the British for uh, uh, something like 100 years. And the British ran it autocratically. And I think it's important to stress this because you sometimes hear about the fact that, you know, uh, the Chinese government ended democracy in Hong Kong. There was no democracy in Hong Kong under the British. There were never elections, free elections to the Chinese, to the Hong Kong parliament or anything like that. But what happened was that Hong Kong, um, at least the sort of um, certain sections of Hong Kong, um, had been obtained by the British as a result of an, what the Chinese called an unequal treaty in the 19th century. And it was due to revert to China in 1997. And after protracted and very difficult negotiations, the British pulled out, the Chinese moved in. But as part of the negotiations, the Chinese agreed to a, a, a deal with Britain, which left in Hong Kong, a political settlement of a certain kind. I mean, it and it enabled Hong Kong to maintain its own uh, political system, which is not democratic, but as I said, it never has been at any time, and its own legal structure, and a certain degree of autonomy from China. Now, one thing that is vital to understand in all of this is that this deal was done not because the Chinese were obliged to make such a deal with Britain. China, uh, Hong Kong, or, or at least 90% of it, was due to revert to China anyway. The Chinese didn't need to deal or, or negotiate or, or agree anything with the British. They had a right in 1997 simply to move in, and they could have done. The reason they did that was twofold. Firstly, they wanted to establish this principle that various parts of China, Hong Kong, and ultimately Taiwan could rejoin China and become a part of China again, whilst maintaining a certain degree of internal autonomy. And this is intended to attract Taiwan. And the second thing they wanted to do was to preserve the economic system and financial system in Hong Kong, which in 1997 was very important for the Chinese economy, which is at that time still very much a, a, an underdeveloped third world economy. I mean, that reforms had begun, but they, it, 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 China was still a very poor country in the 1990s, and technologically and industrially, a very backward one. Now, what has changed since then is that all these dynamics have changed. Um, if the Chinese thought that by granting some measure of autonomy to Hong Kong, um, that would attract Taiwan, well, that hasn't happened. In fact, all the trend in Taiwan is for the Taiwanese to put as much distance between themselves and China as they possibly can. But the other thing that has happened is that, of course, since 1997, the Chinese economy has exploded. And Hong Kong now forms only a very small fraction of that economy and is no longer politically as important to that economy as it once was. So what has been happening is that uh, this autonomy that uh, Hong Kong has secured uh, 
no longer serves China's interests as in 1997 it did. So what has been happening is that the Chinese authorities in Beijing supported, and this really is an important point to stress, by the overwhelming majority of the Chinese population have been looking at Hong Kong and they've been saying to themselves, this really isn't uh, 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 um, suitable anymore. We no longer need this anomalous situation in what is, after all, a Chinese city. And they have been gradually moving towards ending certain features of this autonomy, which had become increasingly difficult for China. Now, one of those was that Hong Kong, the business community that runs Hong Kong, has used this autonomy and its domination over the city government to basically run its own affairs in ways that are not really very satisfactory for Beijing and to engage in many cases in activities that the authorities in Beijing consider to be corrupt. They see this as corruption. Now, Xi Jinping, who is the leader of China, is somebody who takes corruption very, very seriously. So they were pushing, the Chinese authorities have been pushing um, over the last few uh, uh, months for an extradition law to be passed by the Hong Kong parliament that would allow some of these Chinese businessmen, these Hong Kong businessmen based in Hong Kong, who the Chinese authorities consider to be corrupt, to be extradited to China, to face criminal charges there. Now, those same businessmen obviously don't want to see this thing happen at all. And they have uh, um, opposed this extradition law and encouraged protests in Hong Kong against it. And I think it's not just they who have encouraged those protests, but to be very clear, Western powers, notably Britain and the United States, have encouraged those protests also. Now, the Hong Kong government tried to defuse these protests by postponing passing of that law. But by doing so, it firstly showed weakness, but also, of course, it's quite clear that that extradition law and that ending of Hong Kong's special autonomy is now very much on the agenda. So what we are seeing, in effect, is some kind of an insurrection, insurrectionary process now picking up steam in Hong Kong as people in Hong Kong who are connected to the business community and some of them unquestionably who believe in some kind of conception of democracy are now protesting against what they see as the gradual assimilation of Hong Kong into China. Now, as these protests have picked up steam, they become increasingly violent and they are now reaching that tipping point, in my opinion, where the Chinese authorities are not going to be able to tolerate this any longer. And I suspect that before very long, we're going to see riot police move from the mainland into Hong Kong in order to crack down on these protests and bring some order back to the city. I think that tipping point, by the way, has now practically been reached. I know there are some people who say that if the Chinese authorities take that step, it will uh, uh, somehow backfire on them. I don't take that seriously at all. I think that wildly overestimates the importance of Hong Kong now in the general picture of China's economy. And I think that they have probably reached that point where they will say enough's enough. The violence is now getting out of hand in Hong Kong. The protests have become increasingly violent and increasingly, obviously, directed at China itself. And for that reason, rather than tolerate what is now looking increasingly like an insurrectionary and even secessionist movement, the Chinese authorities will act to put to stamp these protests out. OK, so, I mean, there's a couple of interesting points that I would like you to unpack, Alexander, because mm -hmm. I think you're giving a very different view from uh, what the mainstream media is presenting and a lot of things that I read as well. Yeah. Um, 
Now I understand the the historical point in yeah. that there was a time when Hong Kong counted for something like 20, 25 percent of the Chinese economy back in the 90s. And now I think it's like two, three percent. I mean, yes. it's, it's diminished quite drastically. So China yes. has a lot of leverage now, yes. correct? Yes, absolutely. Where in I the mean, past they did not. Exactly. I mean, to me, that is the key to this whole story. Back in the 90s, the people of Hong Kong thought themselves superior to China and considers the kid considered themselves as being the drivers of china and they what were they, they, found, they, they were to they a were. certain extent yeah. to a certain extent i mean one 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 shouldn't exaggerate to what extent right. but you know they they were to a certain extent they are no longer that anymore and as i said they feel that they're being marginalized and um the business community there as i said feels increasingly insecure uh, as china's power over hong kong has been steadily growing, just as Hong Kong's influence over China has been steadily diminishing. But of course, what they're doing by orchestrating these protests, and there's no question at all, I, in my opinion, that these protests were initially orchestrated by the business community to stop this extradition law, is that this thing has now picked up a momentum of its own and is now obviously out of control and I think that the business community itself must now be sensing that having lost control of this process, which they've initiated in the way that they have, they're going to end up with less than what they had previously. They're going to be end up with less than what they started with. OK, the picture that that is being presented on a lot of uh, mainstream media channels, Alexander, is that the extradition, the spark that started these protests was an extradition case yeah. where there was a murder. Um, in Taiwan, yeah. and, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, there was a murder in Taiwan and the husband made it back to Hong Kong and there was different extradition laws between Hong Kong, Taiwan, Taiwan and China, China and Hong Kong, and China um, inserted itself in the process and that's that was yeah. the spark. So it seems that they were trying to move away from this being a case of extradition in the business community to positioning it more as an extradition on, on a human rights uh, level is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Well, this is this is the narrative that we're hearing in the West, but it's very clear that, as I said, what we are really looking at is China's attempts, slowly, not so slowly, incrementally, to extend its legal jurisdiction, the operation of its courts, into Hong Kong itself. Because that's been the protection that business people in Hong Kong have up to now had. They have felt that they've got an effective sort of immunity from uh, um, the arrests uh, 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 and possible extradition to China. So this is a specific criminal case. But as I said, if you look at that extradition law, it's a lot more sweeping. It was a lot more sweeping than it's been you know, set out to be. Uh, and you can understand why some people in Hong Kong were um, upset and alarmed by it. Right, right. Do you think um, that China has mishandled this in any way? Yes. I, I mean, how, how would you categorize China's handling of this situation today? Because this is not this has been going on actually for yes. quite a, quite a long time now. It's not it's yes. not even a one week phenomenon. Now this is this goes mm. back several weeks, if not months. Yes. I, I think the Chinese have left have been far too slow to respond, actually. I, I, I think that there have been all kinds of reasons given why the Chinese government was reluctant to uh, um, involve itself in suppressing the protests in Hong Kong. Uh, I, I think all that has done is uh, made it appear that it's weak and that it's somehow nervous about going into Hong Kong and asserting itself there. And I think all that has done is that it has allowed these protests to spread and, as I said, to get much more violent. And I think this is an important point to make because I think that a lot of people, I've seen some of the reporting in Britain, um, especially in you know places like The Guardian and the BBC, they give the impression that the violence is by author the authorities against the protesters. What is quite obvious to me is that the protests themselves have been pretty violent 
very much from the onset. There's been a very strongly violent element uh, um, underpinning these protests. And I have to say this again, it reminds me a little of the slow reaction of the Chinese government to the Tiananmen protests in 1989. Now, those didn't get violent in that way. But as I said, they were allowed to grow and expand and almost get out of control before the Chinese government reacted. And that provoked a, a much stronger crackdown that might have been necessary if the Chinese government had acted much, much sooner to reassert control over what was going on in Beijing. And I have to say, it also reminds me a little of what happened to, in Ukraine in 2013, 2014, when the then Ukrainian government of Viktor Yanukovych allowed the protests to fester in Tiananmen Square, um, oh, sorry, in uh, Maidan Square, until again, the point came when they uh, got completely out of control and in that case, the result was the overthrow of the government. I think that sometimes, and you know, I, I'm not someone who encourages, uh, you know, uh, premature crackdowns. I understand that people have to be allowed the right to protest, but I think that if governments abdicate their responsibility to control the situation in their streets and allow law and order to break down in this way. Um, then, as I said, that only creates problems further down the line. Protests of this kind would not be tolerated in the United States or Britain. I mean, we would never have got to that point here. And um, there's no reason why the Chinese government should have allowed them to get so far out of control on this occasion. All right, Alexander, to close it out, let me read you how the New York Times has positioned this. And I pulled up an article from June 15th, 2019. The title of that article, Alexander, is The Murder Case That Lit the Fuse in Hong Kong. And bear with me as I, as I pull out some extracts from the first couple paragraphs um, of the article. It says, um, in Hong Kong, before the mass street protests, the tear gas, the tear gas and the clashes with police, uh, before the government went all out for legislation that would that could threaten Hong Kong's special status in China and then abruptly back down, a pregnant woman went on a romantic getaway to Taiwan. Pu Hi Wing, 20, never returned to Hong Kong from that Valentine's Day trip last year, but her boyfriend, Chan Tong Kai, 19, did. He would later tell the Hong Kong police that he had strangled her, stuffed her body in a suitcase, and dumped it in a thicket of bushes near a subway station in Taipei. It was just a local crime story at first. The details dribbling out in the tabloid press, a selfie of the couple on Facebook, grainy camera footage, uh, the circumstances of their last argument, etc. Then, this past February, nearly a year after Mr. Chan's arrest, the Hong Kong government cited the case to propose legislation that would allow the city to transfer criminal suspects to Taiwan and other places with which it lacks an extradition treaty, including mainland China. This is a huge diversion from extradition of the business community. Yeah. Correct, Alexander? What well, do you well, make of how this is being positioned? Well, well, it's an attempt. If I may say so, one of the problems that one always has with any kind of discussion of uh, um, these kind of issues is that people in the West, Western governments, Western media, invariably side with people whom they call businessmen. And I want to make it very clear, not all businessmen in China or in Hong Kong are corrupt. We're talking about a small group of people who, as I said, have been able to hide behind the fact that the Hong Kong government is a corporatist oligarchy in order to get immunity for their own activities. It's very difficult to get Western governments or Western media ever to accept or admit that in any conflict between business people and authority, whether in China or Russia, it is the business people, the so-called business people, the oligarchs, if you like, who are in the wrong. And this is what you see here. So what we see is, of course, the Chinese, the Hong Kong government cited this particular case when they proposed this law. 
fair enough. But that's not what is driving these protests. I, I, I mean, this is, it, it's silly to think so. This is where um, you differ. This is where your analysis, if I exactly, may just interrupt I mean, you. This yes. is why I'm so shocked when I hear you. Yeah. And to yes. our viewers, this is actually the first conversation we're having about this, me yes, and Alexander. Yes. This is why I'm yes. shocked because yes. your analysis is a complete is in a complete different direction, complete different view of what's going on than yes. what we're reading. Yes. I mean, it, it's not conceivable that people are really concerned about a 19-year-old uh, uh, psychopathic or whatever it was killer. I mean, this isn't really what this is about. Obviously, the government of Hong Kong needs to start extraditing people to mainland China if they commit crimes. I mean, that's, that, was, that was the agenda. And that's it, it's core. not... That's the core, that's the of, this, core of it. Of that story. was the core of it. But the real underlying issue for, as I said, these, these, these corporate elites in Hong Kong is that they felt that this expansion of extradition processes, and by the way, I, I should stress one important point about extradition. Extradition doesn't mean that, you know, uh, um, um, the Hong Kong government arrests someone and simply hands them over to China. I mean, a, an extradition process, by definition, has to go through some kind of court process. So, uh, uh, you know, th there, there would be that safeguard always. But as I say, what they were concerned about is the fact that they saw this extradition law as an attack on their privileged position. And can I say again, not all of these people who are protesting in Hong Kong are tools of the... Uh, uh, um, oligarchy, the business oligarchy. There are genuine people there who are protesting because they are angry with China, they believe in democracy and things of that kind. But the underlying problem is, as I said, Hong Kong's loss of status within China, the feeling that Hong Kong is being assimilated to China, and the feeling also, as I said, with these business people and corrupt and gangsters and call them whatever you like, that they are losing this license that they've had up till now to engage in all kinds of activities and not face consequences in China. Do you think very quickly, Alexander, do you think that China is trying to uh, absorb Hong Kong, assimilate it too quickly? Yes. Do you think that may be a... No, no. no. You think I they've, been, they, they've done this appropriately? Yes, I think I th I think on the contrary, I think that uh, on the contrary, I think uh, I've never personally thought that the one uh, uh, you know one country two systems policy was particularly viable. I mean, I, I've, it's always seemed to me that as ch as China became economically bigger and stronger, maintaining this anomalous city state within China, uh, um, um, it, it was simply unworkable. And I, I think that far from being, uh, um, t you know, too too quick to reabsorb uh, Hong Kong into China, the Chinese authorities, for you know, in their own interests, have been too slow. I think they, there's been a lot of bureaucratic inertia here. They probably said to themselves, "Well, the system has been working reasonably well up till now. We won't really interfere with it," and they didn't interfere with it. And now, when they felt the need to start to interfere with it, because as I said, they needed this extradition law and they needed to expand their influence into Hong Kong, which was starting to go sour and get out of hand in all kinds of ways. Now they found that, as I said, um, they have a much more serious problem on their hands than they would have done if they'd acted faster and more decisively much earlier, both in handling these processes and in bringing Hong Kong under China's control that, than would have been the case. Now, can I just add one important point, of course, which is that it's important to stress again that Hong Kong, under, when it was ruled by the British, was a British colony. So it didn't have much autonomy then. The people who ran Hong Kong were British civil servants. That was the reality 
through most of Hong Kong's history. So when people talk about an autonomy that is threatened in Hong Kong, it is a th autonomy that China granted. Didn't have to grant it. It did grant it for certain reasons in 1997, which don't exist anymore. And that's why this, these protests are now taking place, because some people in Hong Kong feel that the loss of that autonomy is dangerous to them. And China no longer sees any real advantage to allowing that uh, autonomy in that overextended form to continue. All right, we will leave it at that. Excellent analysis, Alexander. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below and click on that notifications bell to make sure you get notifications every time we push out a new video. Please hit that like button as well and share the channel with everybody you know outside of YouTube because they are keeping us down. Alexander, they are keeping us down and we want to reach people. So help us out. Help us reach people. What else can people do? They can also donate to us, Alexander, on PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar. The link is in the description box down below. And, of course, you can get a copy of this video in audio format. So visit us on iTunes and SoundCloud. And you can also go to the Durant Shop. That helps us out a whole lot. And you can get great merchandise, mugs, polo shirts, v-necks, stickers, tank tops, hats, you name it. And as you get that merchandise... You can also read ebooks that we have. We have one, oh, we have two ebooks actually we do. We on do. Russia Gate that you get a very special price for. Mm -hmm. The forward was written by Alexander for both of those ebooks. So Alexander, you want to talk about ebooks or you want to talk about uh, apparel and uh, magic uh, mugs? Well, I'm going to talk about both, Alex. Of course, I am, and I'm going to talk about the ebooks first because the ebooks um, are, um, I think, superb pieces of analysis. I say that with absolute, you know, uh, sincerity, absolute sincerity, because on Russia Gate, we were so far ahead of the curve, and I'm going to say this frankly: we were ahead of the curve of practically everybody, not just in our understanding of the overall picture, there were other people who understood that this didn't really make sense, people like Robert Parry, Joe Laurier, lots of people. But in our understanding of the granular problems, the, the detail and how the detail of the story didn't add up. And that's partly what our books are about. But our books actually do try and explain the overall story, because you need to understand the detail to be able to understand the story, but you can lose the story if you spend too much time with the detail. And the, the story was that there was a plot to make Hillary Clinton president of the United States by discrediting Donald Trump, by creating a fictitious association between him and Russia. When that failed, there was an attempt to conceal that failure and to discredit Donald Trump as president, not just by perpetuating this fantasy of an association between him and Russia, but also by launching this bogus investigation to look into that fantasy. The first book looks at the plot, the actual plot by the intelligence community, members of the Hillary Clinton campaign, parts of the media to invent this fabricated story. The second book looks at the Mueller investigation, which is essentially the cover up, trying to conceal that plot and how it was all brought to an end by the person who came in and said, this is all nonsense and it's got to stop, who was the new attorney general of the United States, William Barr. So that's what those two books are about. So if you really want to understand Russiagate, go to those books. And you will understand Russiagate better. And how do we understand these things? How do we stay so far ahead of the curve? Well, it's because we drink tea, in my case, coffee, I think, a lot more plausibly in Alex's from our magic mugs like this. This is this is I mean, we were talking about Russiagate. Well, this is a, a mug of the kind that Putin uh, uh, drinks from with the double headed eagle, which is the double headed eagle, which is the state symbol of Russia. I, lo I love that mug. 
I love that. I think it's so elegant. It's so elegant. And as I said, when he went to the G20 summit, it created such a stir. By the way, I'm wearing a Russian watch also whilst I'm drinking from this mug. But anyway, that's what I'm doing. Uh, it's a fantastic mug. It keeps you refreshed. It keeps you uh, 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 vigorous. It keeps your mind alert. So when you read all the rubbish that, you know, uh, uh, people like James Comey and all these awful people were dredging out, the, you know, you're, you're, you, you, you can actually stay calm and cool and collected by drinking from these, these mugs. And of course, you do it in shirts like this, this magnificent polo shirt that I'm wearing at the moment. This is our own double headed eagle pointing east and west, covering all points of the compass. We've just co covered Hong Kong. We cover every part of the world in our geopolitical analysis. And we do so, do it wearing these fantastic shirts, 100% cotton, beautifully tied, fits perfectly, as my wife has pointed out recently to Alex. The feedback we're getting on all these things is phenomenal from the people who buy them. So help yourself by buying them from our shop. Help the Durand by doing so. Alex will tell you how to do it. Yep. Just go to the uh, description box down below. You will see a link to the Durand shop where you can pick up all our merchandise and the ebooks as well, which you can get as a download. Alexander McCurse, editor in chief of the Durand. Thank you very much. Until next time, everybody, take care. Mm -hmm.